Hey everyone, Chang here and welcome to my channel. Today is a monumentous occasion because guess what? This is going to be the final video for the CBS practice exam. Each and every one of the videos that we've produced so far had five problems. The practice exam that they released in the website is 50 problems. So guess what? This is the 10th and final video. Now, as amazing as it is, I really wanted you guys to see the different approaches that we had, different ways of altering problems and make it more difficult, more easy, or just to build up the specific skills that we might find a weakness of ours, right? So that's what I'm hoping with this video series. It's not that I expect everyone to look at it and then go and become a substitute teacher in the state of California, right? No, it's the broader image is just to be able to see, all right, certain problems is extremely simple. Great. I know certain problems, maybe not. Maybe it's a skill that I haven't touched so much so far, but Guess what? I can always find a way to find practice problem. I can always alter the structure of the problem without losing the overall goal of the problem and still practice that way as well. So let's, without further ado, problem number 46 to 50. So let's begin. All right, so this is problem number 46. Now here's the thing though. I've left out basically the entire question of the problem because guess what? It's the last set of problems. Let's have a little fun, right? Notice that once you start building more practice and building more experience, just by looking at the information given, you can sort of guess what kind of answer or what kind of question they're going to be asking you. So they give you a chart, this is the middle school school bell, and then they have your classes from second, third, fourth, lunch, and fifth period, right? Then they have your start time, your end time. Now they fill it all up except for this one missing box. So even without that super wordy, I think it's like a paragraph or two long question that you have to read to understand what they're asking, right? Basically, we have a general idea. What the hell is the missing information? Simple as that, right? And of course, I'm going to write the possibility right here, A, B, C, D, E, if you guys can't see it, 12, 15, 12, 19, 12, 30, 12, 36, and 12, 40. Here we have 8, 40, 9, 36, and then 9, 40, 10, 36, 10, 40, 11, 36, then at lunchtime is 11.40 to 12.15. There's a missing some time slot. And then we have our 1 to 1, 1.15, basically. All right, so what is the missing information? Now, here's the tricky part, right? It's so easy to just start seeing a pattern. Well, this is all, guess what? 8.40, 9.40, 10.40, 11.40. So this must be 12.40. No, don't do that, right? So uh, imagine this. In school middle school, high school, whatsoever, each class is designated a specific amount of time. Doesn't matter if the time schedule itself changed, but there's a specific a lot of time that so everyone, you know, get a fair, equal opportunity, equal amount of time to teach and learn, right? So basically the whole core of finding the missing information is not to see the pattern going up and down, but to see the difference starting and end time. How much is each chunk of time different? And then make sure that they all get this same equal amount, right? So from 840 to 936, we've noticed that actually what happened is we have 56 minutes of class time, right? So let's, uh, let's use a different color marker. So that's obvious. 56 minutes, right? Now, the same thing for each of them. The only difference that you will notice is that at lunchtime, that's slightly different, right? At lunchtime, you get a different amount of time. But guess what? Fifth period, once again, you get 56 minutes. Supposedly, you know, there's always special cases, but word problems like this, assume you do. All right, so 56 minutes. So if that's the case, rather than just trying to follow the pattern that way, go backwards. From 115, what is 56 minutes before 115? And from there, you can sort of see, well, at least you know that 56 in terms of 115 probably has to have a nine in it to change well, six to five, right? So in this case, the only one that really has a nine in it is probably this guy right here. So this is your answer. If you're not sure, you can always just go backwards just from here, subtract 56 minutes and see which one it lands on. Most likely it's going to be B. That is your answer right there. Amazing, right? We don't have to write two paragraphs of the problem, just looking at the structure and we already know what it's asking. All right, so this is problem number 47 and guess what? Have you ever heard of a saying where it says a human makes plan and God laughs? Well, there it is, right? 
Maybe not God, universe, whatsoever. I just went over a problem number 47, talk, 46, talking about how when you look at the information given, you can most of the time see exactly what they want you to solve in the problem, right? Without actually reading the problem. And of course, the next problem, that's not the case. You actually have to read the problem because they give you all the information. Now they're asking you something specific about the table that they've given you, right? So in this case, they give you a table and there's more at the bottom, but we don't need it, right? And then you have to figure out what exactly it's asking, what information does it want? So first and foremost, this is a chart of the US and the world's silver production, right? They give you the year, the, what's made in the US, and then what's made in the entire world. So world, you know, includes the US. So here it is. You have the year from 1930, 1935, 1940, 1945, 1950, 1955, blah, 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 and you keep on going. Now, the question itself is how many tons of silver were produced outside of the US in 1950? And that's why I say I don't need all the other information. It's only focus only worried about 1950. So this is the one that we are worried about as well. This roll right here, that is it, right? Nothing else matters. So as you guys can already imagine, if you want to change a problem just to get used to reading tables, charts about silver production, go ahead, right? Change it to a different year and then answer the same question, right? With different numbers. But the idea is now today we're focusing on 1950. Now it's asking about the silvers produced outside of the US. You have your silvers produced by the US and you have the silver produced by the world. And remember the world includes the US. So in order to find the amount of silver produced outside of the US, all you have to do is just get the amount produced by the entire world and take out what's in the US. So it's a simple subtraction problem once you know the information you're looking for. So in this case, you have six, two, three, or six, three, two, three. That's so why that was kind of weird, right? And it's subtract one, three, four, seven. Simple as that. And then you just finish your subtraction problem and it's fairly simple, right? And then you can go, you know, step by step if you're um, not used to subtraction with large numbers. So in this case, it's 13. What is that? That's six. That's 11. 11 is that seven. And then this one is going to be 12. That's nine. And this one's five. It's four. Boom. There it is. There is your answer. 4,976, right? Simple as that. These kind of problems, and for the next, I think, three problem as well, they're all, can you get the information, right? That's the key focus, because after that, it's just basic computation, if necessary. Sometimes it's just look at it and grab the information. So let's move on to the next problem, and you'll see what I mean. All right, so here's our next problem. Now, this is more of looking at the graph and seeing if you understand the graph. Now, this is not as accurate as I would like because I'm just terrible at drawing graph. If you guys look at the link attached, you guys can see the actual picture of the graph. But the point is, what is the question asking? The question is asking something fairly simple. It's just whether you guys comprehend and can get the information from the graph, right? What is the difference or max difference in energy consumption between the two states? Two states are the hydroelectric and nuclear, right? The dotted line, the poorly drawn dotted line right here, starting here, all the way here is your nuclear and then your single or solid lines are your hydroelectric. And then they give you these basic, I guess you could say, answer that you can choose from. Now, the key word is max difference. There is a lot of difference, some going higher, some going lower, right? Here is where they intersect, right? And the difference exacerbate near the end. So in this case, you have to figure out which one is the max. Now, even though this graph is not as well drawn as I would like, right? We're looking at each and every one of these and the best way, or not the best way, a good approach is that since we're talking about max, start off with the biggest number and then start eliminating going backwards, right? That at least allows you to know that if you have an answer or a potential answer, that is your max already. Instead of trying to figure out all the possible answers and then afterwards going through the trouble of trying to figure out what the max is as well. So luckily for us, every time they have these kind of multiple choice, they usually list it from least to greatest. So least to greatest, greatest is at the bottom. So you start off at the bottom and you just look at where is the biggest difference. Now, even though it's not as obvious, the biggest difference is actually right here when you look at the actual more accurate graph, right? It's uh, this one is around three, this one's a little bit above six, whereas this one is a uh, close to zero, not necessarily around zero. Um, and this one is a little past two. So that difference is smaller than this difference. So this is the max difference. So since we are gonna be focusing on this guy right here, and we know this is about three, this is about 
six or uh, six plus, like a little bit above six, right? Now we can start looking and eliminating answers. Now you can definitely go from top to bottom, right? Cause that's just what we're conditioned to. We'll probably do that. But since we know it's max, let's just go from bottom to top, top because guess what? The bottom is always bigger. So 5.9, yeah, probably not, right? Because this is three, about three. This is about little six ish, a little more, right? So there's no way it's gonna hit close to a six difference, right? So this one immediately is a no, right? This one probably because it's a little above six, right? And it's a little close to three, so maybe. And then afterwards, guess what? Well, this could be as well 2.4, right? But since this is about three, this is a little bit above six, right? It's probably a little bit bigger than two. And just from then on, because we know everything else is smaller, we immediately can figure out this is the answer. Even though initially, we're not entirely sure. I mean, some of us are just, that's it, right? That's the answer, right? But if we're not entirely sure, at least we can eliminate the rest because guess what? Even though there are potential differences that meet this number, it's smaller. And we don't want the smaller ones because guess what? Max. Now, if it says the minimum difference, right? That's a different story, right? Then you're gonna go from top to bottom. You're gonna see if this is it, but minimum difference is probably the one where it's, you know, intersecting. So that's a different variation of a potential a potential variation of a problem like this. So there it is. This was more of looking at graphs and seeing if you can get the necessary information. So let's move on to the next one. I think the next one is sort of a picture. So that's pretty cool. Let's take a look at that. All right, so there's our problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, I left out a lot of information because I honestly think they're not necessary, right? It's pr pretty simple. Uh, I was talking about some like high crop yield in like a 19 some year, right? And then they give you the name of various different farms and then they give you a percentage of each and every one of the farms, right? The whole key, the whole point of this is that it's a pie graph. Now, the lovely thing about pie graphs, right? Or circle graph or whatever name you want to go by it is that the entire circle represents 100%. That's entire population, entire basically consideration of all variables, right? So in this case, what happens is, well, they give you all these information and they have one of them, I forgot which farm it is, but then basically they wanna ask you what is that missing information? How much do they produce? Well, since we know that this entire thing is 100%, right, then we have all these information, all we have to do is just find out the missing number. Fairly simple, right? All we have to do is add these guys and you can subtract 100 with the sum of these guys, or you can already figure out what is missing. So in this case, we have our 24, we have our 21, we have our 31, we have our seven. We add them all together, that is of the 83, I think? Yes, okay, 83. So in this case, what was 83? That's these guys, so what is the missing one? We know that's 100%, so if you really want to, you could do 100 minus 83, or you know, in your head, and then you know that's 17. So this missing number right here, even though not drawn to scale, is 17%. Okay, plain and simple. Now, the last thing I mentioned is actually key to a lot of these things. You gotta be very careful, right? A lot, a lot of them are basically not drawn to scale. Now, some of the problem is really great. It tells you exactly that it's not drawn to scale, so you can't estimate. Uh, some of them are not. Assume that they're not, right? Because the reason for that, the information provided of the picture is actually a lot more important than the picture itself because sometimes it's not drawn in a wonderful way. So imagine looking at this, for example, this is 17%, but because I draw it poorly, right? I don't remember if the picture is accurate or not, but here's the thing. Just by looking at this, if you make an assumption that, oh, well, this is very close to 31%, that's gonna bite you in the ass, right? You always have to pay attention more closely to the given information than the scaling of the picture. Nine out of 10 time is not drawn to scale. The good problems will say picture not drawn to scale. The bad ones will not say that, but guess what? Unless there is some justification that you can automatically assume they are, always go with the safer option. Assume they are not, go with the information they give you relating to the actual problem and then solve it that way. So let's move on to our final problem. All right, so our last and final problem, of course, this is the killer problem. This is the one where you have to bust out your calculus skill, right? You have a graph right there. You need to find the derivative of a specific interval because you're trying to find the greatest amount of sales increase 
based on this graph. No, just kidding. Uh, you don't need calculus for this, but I guess, guess what? Sneak preview, right? For calculus, if you really are so inclined to study it, right? That's a lot about slope, you know, finding derivatives and blah, blah, blah. But no, this one is just fairly simple. They give you a graph. They have all these different inclines because it's mapping the sales increase per year from 1940, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, right? And then from 50, 100, all the way to 300, right? And is asking for what is the greatest amount. So everything I said about the calculus is total BS. The one thing that is true is that you're trying to find the greatest slope because guess what? The greatest slope between the year means that you have increased in sale the greatest amount, right? So if you look at it, basically in terms of slope, right? The lower it is, the less sales, the higher it is, or the more steeper it is, right? That is the greater amount of sales. So even though this is fairly close and just, just because of horrible drawing, right? The graph itself, these are also fairly close, which is not great for us because guess what? If they're fairly close, then yeah, we wanna find a steeper one. But luckily for us, since this is just the CBEST exam and it's not gonna do any real tricky question, right? Usually it's fairly obvious which one is the most steepest slope, right? So in this case, if you look at it, all right, this one is pretty good. This one looks even better because it's more steep, right? And then all of a sudden it starts leveling out. So out of all of them, this one, just from our basic, lovely mathematical observation, is the steepest one. So which between which year and which year, and they give you a selection of year, it is clear that it's between 1950 and 1960 is the greatest amount and just like that you have finally answered the final question with makeshift calculus all right cool all right so there you have it that is problem 50 and that is marks the end of our c best practice exam so what have i learned going through 50 problems of the c best practice exam well first and foremost it wastes a lot of marker that sucked uh there's a lot of word problem and i don't like word problem after all that still don't like word problem sucked right but more importantly I love the idea that it is using a broad range of different topics. Now, here's the thing. Once again, I need to emphasize math is a tool. Yes, it is a study. People can find joy in it. I do find joy in it as well. But the idea is that overarching math is a tool. So rather than just going and specializing in one specific topic through and through, which can make you amazing at only that one topic, understand that because it's a tool, it's sometimes even better to just have a broad range of knowledge of all the different subtopic and category in math, right? And I feel like the CBEST exam, even though some seems basic, even though some seem trivial and weird and unnecessary, it emphasized the fact that you need a lot of different mathematical skills to problem solve because that is the overarching goal if you wanna think of math as a tool. So once again, thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please like, comment, and subscribe. And from then on, now we can start working on problems that I find interesting, you know, topics that I find interesting, or just some weird stuff with math. Thank you again. I will see you in the next video.